Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to share with you uh, and discuss, uh, have a discussion among many experts in the field of electric school buses and vehicle to grid technologies for the launch of our uh, most recent report, uh, Vehicle to Everything Enabled Electric School Buses for Emergency Response, uh, an implementation guide and mutual agreement template. Um, this report focuses on the implementation of using electric school buses as mobile power units in emergency response events. My name is Will Dreyer, uh, and I'm a policy manager with the Electrification Coalition, and I'll be today's host for the webinar. Uh, before we jump in today uh, and discuss uh, into today's discussion, uh, I wanted to preview how we'll run the webinar and tee up some of the intro information. Um, uh, following the discussion of our panelists, we'll hopefully have time for uh, some uh, audience Q&A. Uh, please ask any of your questions uh, in the Q&A function uh, in your Zoom. Uh, we'll be uh, hoping to address these towards the end of the panel, um, and if not, we'll hopefully follow up, or uh, we'll look to follow up uh, via email after the event. Um, for those of you who may have to drop early or want to share this content with others later, uh, just let you, letting you all know that we are recording this, um, and it'll be made available online uh, following uh, the event. So a quick background uh, on the organizations that uh, work to pull this together. Uh, SAFE, formerly known as Securing America's Future Energy, uh, was founded to reduce our nation's reliance on oil due to national security, uh, economic, and geopolitical risks that are associated with our reliance on a volatile global commodity. Uh, SAFE is working to achieve this by accelerating the adoption of uh, transformative transportation uh, and mobility technologies, and by securing our domestic and allied supply chains to maintain our national strategic advantage. SAFE's grid security project uh, is also working to ensure that we have a reliable, resilient, and secure electric electrical system to support our growing needs, uh, including our transition to an electric transportation future. Uh, the Electrification Coalition is SAFE's sister organization, uh, and we are the uh, transportation electrification arm uh, of this effort. Uh, the EC was formed back in 2009, and, and after, uh, after publishing uh, the nation's first uh, electric vehicle roadmap. Uh, while both SAFE uh, and EC have a federal focus, uh, EC is also working at the state and local levels to advance both policy uh, and implementation of vehicle electrification. We also work very closely with our Energy Security Leadership Council, uh, which is a group of retired, retired uh, four-star admirals, generals, and business leaders uh, helping to achieve our goals. Just want to tee up uh, a little bit of the market opportunity here we have for um, uh, using electric school buses as grid resilience resources. Um, uh, just a quick snapshot on your screen now uh, of the committed deployments for electric school buses in the United States. Uh, and this is data thanks to uh, the World Resources Institute. Um, you can see that the past, uh, just in the past six quarters, uh, the U U.S. has uh, commitments have grown quite a bit. Um, uh, and this data is all prior to uh, the announcement of the Clean School Bus Program Awards, uh, which awarded nearly a billion dollars uh, back in September to school districts around the nation. Uh, that will go towards the uh, deployment of over uh, 2,000 additional electric school buses. And uh, before we jump into our discussion, I wanted to give you all just a, a brief highlight of uh, what some of the common acronyms you might hear uh, uh, during the discussion. Um, I won't read all of them for you, but I think you know the important one to highlight uh, here is the uh, vehicle to X or, or vehicle to everything, uh, using this as an umbrella term for, for all of the potential grid services an EV can, can provide, uh, vehicle to grid, vehicle to building, uh, and vehicle to load. So with that, uh, we can jump into our discussion. I'll hand it over to my colleague, uh, Ladine Freemuth. Uh, Ladine, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Will. Thanks everyone for joining today. My name is Ladine Freemuth and I am a senior advisor to SAFE's Grid Security Project. I'm pleased to welcome all of you and our panelists. As Will noted, this event marks the launch of the SAFE and Electrification Coalition Vehicle to Everything Implementation Guide. This publication consists of an implementation guide and mutual aid agreement template for using vehicle to everything enabled electric school buses as mobile power units to enhance resilience during emergencies. I want to begin by thanking Catherine Stankin for managing this effort and Will and our Safe and Electrification Coalition team for bringing this document and today's event to fruition. My thanks also to WRI's Electric School Bus Initiative for its support of this effort. I also want to thank the dozens of experts across the electricity, transportation, emergency management, and related sectors 
who contributed their expertise to this publication, including today's panelists. I will give a very brief overview of this guide, then we'll turn to our panelists to share, our, to share their insights. This guide provides the concrete steps for the relevant parties or stakeholders to implement before, during, and after an emergency to use electric school buses to provide backup power to a critical building or load in an emergency. For SAFE and the Electrification Coalition, the national security perspective is paramount. Vehicle to Everything has the potential to enhance resilience of to enhance the resilience of U.S. critical infrastructure and to uh, help save lives and protect health and thereby enhance our energy and national security. And before I jump in, I'll also just level set by um, setting a few brief definitions and Greg can supplement these in his remarks as well. Uh, when we say vehicle to grid, we mean rather than having a, ve a vehicle, a charger charge a vehicle in one direction, that a vehicle can charge back to a grid when we're talking about the grid, and we're, when we're talking about vehicle to everything or vehicle to load, and in the case of this document, we're talking about isolating a load or a building from the grid and having a vehicle charge back to that facility. And in this case, we use uh, school as an, as an emergency shelter as an example and uh, providing having electric school buses provide emergency backup power to that school in an emergency. As you probably are well aware, mutual assistance is intended to improve emergency preparedness by facilitating and streamlining coordination between state and local governments, as well as electric utilities and other stakeholders, as well as with the federal government when needed. This assistance obligates resources such as equipment and personnel for the public good. In this guide, as, as I mentioned, we focus on using bi-directionally enabled electric school buses to provide backup power to schools that are being used as emergency shelters. However, this is just an example, and the ESBs could provide emergency backup power to other critical facilities, such as hospitals, elderly care facilities, or other facilities or loads. In essence, the ESBs, the electric school buses, should be thought of as being interchangeable with other types of emergency backup power resources, such as stationary backup generators. And we like to think of mutual assistance as a force multiplier. With this in mind, the mutual aid agreement is intended to conform to and be compatible with the existing national incident management system and the incident command system structures that are part of the overarching national preparedness system. These National Incident Management System, or NIMS, and Incident Command System, or ICS, structures guide how emergency response personnel at all levels of government, as well as non-governmental entities and the private sector, are supposed to work together when preparing for and responding to incidents. Following are some of the specific steps needed for bi-directionally enabled electric school buses to be used as mobile power units before, during, and after an emergency. We like to think of this document or guide as uh, providing a recipe, the really concrete steps that uh, the school districts and other and emergency managers and other stakeholders can take, as, as I said, before, during, and after an emergency. And this is really, this document really is focused on these concrete steps. It does not really focus on policy, although we will touch on some policy uh, measures and implications in the course of today's discussion. Uh, so prior to an emergency and well in advance, uh, the, the steps that need to be taken before an emergency range from ensuring that the relationships among the key stakeholders and entities are in place so that when there actually is an emergency, these relationships are in place and the, the stakeholders and entities involved in the mutual aid agreement can have much smoother interactions immediately prior to and during an emergency. And then these steps also include, of course, ensuring that we have the uh, requisite bi-directional chargers, inverters, and other essential software and hardware installed at the proposed site in this case at the school that will be used as an emergency shelter. The steps during an emergency range from calling upon and obtaining the, the bi-directionally enabled electric school buses 
to islanding and connecting the electric school bus to the building to provide backup power. And then again, just highlighting some of the key steps after an emergency, uh, the steps range from notifying the local electric utility that the electric school bus is being disconnected from the school building. This is a safety measure to essentially doing an after action report or assessment, meaning assessing or evaluating how the process and the provision of backup power went among the key stakeholders. The guide, of course, goes into more detail on these and other key steps in the process. With this, I will turn to Greg Presge to introduce yourself, Greg, and provide some opening remarks. And I want to thank all of our panelists again for being here today. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks, Ladine. Um, I'm super excited to be here today because we've been working on this for a while, and um, and I think we've gotten to this really great point. So, I'm Greg Kresge. I'm senior manager for utility engagement and transportation electrification with uh, World Resources Institute, and we've been working on this uh, not only within the electric school bus initiative, but we're looking at this disaster resiliency piece as well as, um, you know, and using existing architecture and, and systems in place for emergency response. Um, like Ladine said, using NIMS, the National Incident Management System, as well as the Incident Command System and operations, emergency operations plans. Um, this is meant to be a vehicle and an avenue in, uh, in front of a disaster. You don't want to be doing this at the time that you need it. You want to do it in advance. So while these uh, these school buses are uh, might be available, there's also work that needs to be done on the front end um, to make sure that load is isolated and a whole bunch of other things. But we didn't want to wait to provide the avenue for these for these resources um, to you know be put into place or be considered until it's until it's too late or there is a disaster or there is a facility that is set up and ready to to be able to handle this bi-directional discharging of energy for a good purpose because school buses are are great for this one there's uh there's been this huge adoption and funding mechanism that has been put in place uh recently with the clean school bus program funding and other funding mechanisms and then in addition to that these resources are not being used for student transportation in emergencies or disasters um so they're sitting there idle being you know uh, hopefully charged and ready to go and and have energy in them that can actually power facilities for quite a while if it's done correctly and the and the the foundational work is done in advance so this is a, i i come i've been in incident command system uh, roles for many 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 years this is using that mechanism which would um in in a lot of cases require a disaster declaration but it doesn't uh it doesn't uh, preclude use of these resources and also gives the reimbursement mechanism um, for these these resources to be used just like any other resource when you're responding to a disaster. So this could be like a, a bulldozer or a tent or a um, in a great comparison as a diesel mobile generator. So um, so the we want to set up this avenue in advance. That's what this mutual aid agreement is about and the implementation guide. So thank you. I will turn it back over to you, Ladine. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. That's great level setting at the outset. And with that, Kevin, I will turn to you to please introduce yourself and provide some opening remarks. Great. Uh, and thanks to the folks at the Electrification Coalition for inviting us to be here today. Uh, and do appreciate that. Uh, I'm Kevin Matthews uh, with First Student. I'm head of electrification. Uh, First Student is North America's largest operator of school buses. So we operate 46,000 school buses across North America. So that's in 37 states and all provinces in uh, Quebec. Uh, we also operate the largest fleet of electric school buses in North America. We have about 240, just a little bit shy of that on the road today. We count actually operating uh, school buses, not the way WRI does on committed, but actually buses run, running children. And we're adding about 10 to 15 per month uh, into our fleet. Uh, for the last decade, a little over a decade, I've been working in the electric school bus space, uh, working with a wide variety of partners, uh, utilities, first responders, uh, school districts, uh, you name it, uh, OEMs, uh, school bus dealers, 
uh, around how school buses can be used in a, a variety of different ways from transporting students uh, to our subject here today as a part of an emergency response. So look forward to uh, sharing some ideas, taking some uh, feedback from folks and then seeing where we can advance this discussion. Great, thank you, Kevin. And with that, Manoj, I will turn to you to introduce yourself, please, and provide some opening remarks. Thank you, Ladine. Thank you, Will. Uh, again, thanks to Electrification Coalition and SAFE. Very honored to be part of this prestigious uh, panel. I am uh, Manoj Karwas, Head of Sales for Borg Warner EV Charging. I've uh, been in the EV space for about 14 years. About six months ago, our company got acquired by Borg Warner. So we were originally Rhombus Energy Solutions, a 10-year-old company, founded in 2012, headquarters in San Diego. I'm calling from Michigan, where we manufacture everything in the US. Very proud to say that. Uh, manufacture DC chargers, with nearly 70% US content, the only company doing it today. In addition, we have a design center in India. Uh, we have a wide range of DC fast charging uh, technologies and products. We have the only bi-directional DC fast charger, that's UL1741SA. We have about 1,500 systems deployed throughout North America. What's very unique about our company is our evolution. We started making high-powered bidirectional inverters. Then one of our customers said, hey, can you make a DC fast charger that's bidirectional? So unlike, let's say, other good companies out there, we came from high-powered bidirectional inverters and then moved to bidirectional DC chargers. And we really feel that this is a unique time. I've been doing this for 14 years. Uh, this is my third charging company. I've been involved in deploying tens of thousands of charging stations. This is unlike any time um, in the history that I've been involved in, uh, in my working experience. We have a very unique opportunity to take advantage of school buses um, and make sure they're all bi-directional, make sure all the infrastructure is bi-directional for not only total cost of ownership, return on investment, uh, grid resiliency, national security, and, and, and a lot of other reasons. So I'm very excited to be part of this panel and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you, Manoj. So with that, we'll open up the, a moderated discussion among our panelists, and then we will save time at the end for questions from the audience. And I also want to encourage the audience to provide questions along the way. We will read them throughout, and uh, we want this to be a very interactive session. So please be thinking of your questions and submit them, and Will will help read them during the course of the discussion. Uh, with that, Greg, I'll begin with you. If you could please describe some of the ways in which using electric school buses as mobile power units facilitate a more equitable access to emergency backup power. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so our overarching um, priority within WRI's electric school bus initiative is around um, serving dis disadvantaged communities and making sure that they have the resources um, that they might not otherwise uh, be able to get or have the resources to even apply for. It, this is a, is a very important aspect of, of serving these communities. And then in addition to that, these are resources that, um, that schools as shelters is not anything new. So this seems to be a very good fit. The school buses are used to you know, transporting children back and forth between the schools. Oftentimes you'll have school uh, buildings become shelters, whether that's the gymnasium or whether that's the, the um, multi-purpose room or the cafeteria. You know, those might be places where you're setting up cots or you're distributing food, or in some cases, maybe you're providing um, some other service. So it, it, it depends on the, on the situation. These are spread throughout the communities. Um, they, they tend to be equally, you know, pretty accessible. And then in addition to that, these uh, school buses, if we're able to do uh, this planning ahead of time and be able to actually put in some bi-directional charging at the facility and then also isolate that load, you're not going to want to do event lighting, um, you know, like at a basketball game in the gymnasium when you're having a disaster and you're trying to, you know, limit the amount of energy you're using, you want to do some load reduction and efficiency improvements. And then in addition, Choosing which loads are critical. You know, are you are you wanting to provide power to the air conditioning system, or are you wanting to pro provide power to a cooking facility or refrigerators or something along those lines to be able to keep food um, cold or 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 safe and and secure? So, 
with that, um, this seems to be a very natural fit if we can, you know, uh, basically put in this architecture at the at the shelters where they're needed. Um, it serves the communities that that uh, where they're located, which is spread across the nation, <clears throat> and it's a familiar environment. So, since these places are already being used as shelters, it seems pretty uh, pretty a pretty symbiotic relationship to also have these buses be able to pull up with their stored energy that they aren't being that they're not using for uh, student transportation at that time. And in some cases, if it's done right. Uh, and we and you know in the implementation guide, some of these uh, critical facilities can be uh, powered for days on this stored energy. So you know that is a resiliency aspect, which is it's getting it's getting power to where it needs to go. This is oftentimes when there's no grid power, and in addition, it's in these communities where these facilities are already located. And so we're not only talking about say a school as a shelter. But we're also talking about, say, a parking lot where there might be a tent, you know, a tent set up for shelter and providing Wi-Fi wi hotspots to the community or some other service. So that's that's it's a great fit. We're looking at this, uh, and these these buses have large batteries. So Kevin can can speak more about that, and so can Manoj. These these uh, these large capacity batteries. Have the ability to store a, a, a pretty large amount of energy and when you put them in series together you can have four or five buses be able to discharge that energy pull up to that facility and be able to plug in so that's what we're looking at setting up and that's where we're going with this mutual aid agreement to get all those steps in place even before the infrastructure is installed so and doing it in the communities that need it the most first Yes, and I'll, and the communities that need it most, though, the underserved communities are often, the, the people in those communities often are the least able to evacuate, for example, during an emergency and relocate. So they're the ones who need the shelters the most and therefore need this backup power. Uh, with that, Kevin, can you please speak to how you are or how you envision bidirectionality being incorporated into electric school bus deployment? Yeah, so primarily it's done at the charging station uh, the OEMs who are manufacturing electric school buses this time are not in favor of putting the inverters on their buses uh, there's a weight penalty uh, that, that comes with doing that and even on a school bus there's a space penalty uh, that, that comes with that and it's been explored as, as an option so really uh, putting the charging infrastructure uh, and, and the correct bi-directional capability at the location that's been identified uh, that needs to be supported is really the critical step. Uh, of course, at our lots uh, where we operate off of, we have the bi-directional capability on our lots, but our, our lots are often far away uh, from the needed infrastructure areas. And so being able to roll our buses there is, is real critical uh, to get to a place that has the appropriate charging infrastructure uh, that can accept our buses, to A, to be plugged into, and B, to be a, get the communication link uh, to send power back to them. Uh, the one simple thing we could do uh, that doesn't take a great deal of infrastructure, uh, and this is discussions we had with a couple of utilities and first responding organizations that went through Hurricane Sandy, uh, was just put, or Super Storm Sandy, depending on how you want to phrase it, uh, is put USB charging ports at the seats on the bus, uh, because many in many urban areas, uh, people do not own cars and other things where they just need to charge their cell phone, uh, their PDA and being able to pull a bus up outside a, a community center, an apartment complex, a housing area uh, where folks can come in a sheltered environment because buses are enclosed uh, to be able to charge their phones and, and PDAs can actually be one of those critical elements uh, that we haven't thought about and doesn't require a lot of infrastructure up front other than the OEMs uh, agreeing to put charging ports uh, at the seats. Great. And that's a good segue. Manoj, I'll start with you, but I invite all of the panelists to please jump in. Can you speak to uh, what are some of the additional developments that have to occur, both in terms of technology, policy, or other aspects to enable electric school buses to be used as mobile power units during emergencies? Yeah, great question. Um, as we look at the ecosystem, it is an ecosystem when you deploy um, a bi-directional uh, system. There's four legs of a table. One, you need to pick a school bus that is bi-directional. 
So for those making decisions, talk to your OEM customers to talk to uh, first student and make sure the buses are bi-directional. Second, you need what's called a utility aggregator, then get the interconnection agreement with that utility, communicate to the bus or the charger. Third, you need the utility to participate. Some utilities are more progressive. There's over 3,000 utilities in the US. Not all are the same. Uh, I know this from my own experience. And getting that interconnection agreement uh, takes a little bit of effort. And the fourth, you need a charger. And we firmly believe that to do this, um, at, this is a once in a generation opportunity to electrify our fleet. We need to make sure we make the right decisions. And you could probably buy something very inexpensive, a charger online, but is that really gonna meet your future needs? So we really firmly believe that with the funding that's available for the EPA grant and others, moving towards DC charging gives you the opportunity to not only meet your future needs, but a lot of the issues that were just mentioned today um, and that is part of this panel. And um, that's part of what we believe is very important. And also when you're selecting the right partners, make sure it's aligned to your use case, um, understanding your duty cycle, state of charge, how are you using it, where it's located. These are all critical elements that can be done um, early on in the process. Um, as an example, with the technology we have, we separate the power control system, the power cabinet from the dispenser. It can be up to 500 feet away. That's another added benefit because the buses are fairly large and you wanna be able to have some separation from where the power cabinets are, which they could be put, like as I said, 500 feet away and put the dispensers very close by. So these are all key elements about having a successful ecosystem, take advantage of the funding that's available. Um, it, it can be very uh, economical to move to DC charging and the, the benefits are tremendous as has been discussed right now. And I'll just elaborate, the, the EPA program that you mentioned is the EPA Clean School Bus Program, which provides $5 billion in grants to states and localities to deploy electric school buses. So as you said, uh, but I think it bears underscoring and repeating, it's really important to have these policies in place so that the bi-directional capability can be installed and implemented on the front end so that we don't have to do it retroactively because doing it retroactively will be more expensive. Uh, another policy that's out there uh, from these recent laws, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law or Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the In Inflation Reduction Act is the NEVI program, the National Electric Vehicle Initiative, which also provides billions of dollars to develop electric vehicle charging corridors and to uh, deploy electric vehicle charging equipment across communities, again, focusing primarily on underserved and underprivileged and remote uh, communities. So that's another important program. And the Inflation Reduction Act also contains a tax credit, not, not just for electric vehicles and larger, the medium and heavy duty vehicles for the first time, but also for the electric vehicle chargers. And as part of that, for the first time, bi-directional charging equipment is included. So these are some, uh, as you said, you know, groundbreaking and unique opportunities to advance policies that will facilitate the deployment of these types of equipment and to do it on the front end. Yeah. Well, from a policy standpoint as well, you, you've got to start the conversation with the first responders uh, and those that support first responders like FEMA. Uh, first responders are, they do away things a certain way and that's because it's tried and true. Uh, because in an emergency, you don't want to be trying out new technology. You were going to go with what's there. And so getting first responders to recognize that this is a technology that can be successful and help them fulfill their missions is really a critical step uh, to having adoption here. Uh, because then that leads to FEMA and other organizations that have funds uh, to work with first responders to do pre-deployment, do pre-hardening uh, type activities. Uh, that can really benefit us because that's where you then begin to look at the policy implications at the local level. Well, where do we want these buses to go? You know, do we want them to go to the water infrastructure system? Uh, do we want them to go to the hospital, uh, the gas station? Believe it or not, gas stations are kind of critical to first responders uh, because people count on gasoline to run their generators uh, for, for uh, shelter in place purposes. Uh, or are we going to go to traffic intersections uh, just to get help with traffic control issues? So that really needs to be mapped out and done with first responders so they're comfortable that this is a technology that works, that they'll work to implement 
uh, and do that. The other thing we have to be aware of on, on the policy and funding side is some school buses are used for evacuation purposes. Uh, so in coastal areas where you have several days before a storm hits, they will be used for evacuation purposes. You have to understand which buses are leaving town, which are, are, are potentially uh, staying behind is a critical component of there. And the other issue then you have to be replanning is who's going to drive the bus. Uh, because it's great to have all this available, but if you don't have a driver that can bring that bus to that facility uh, that's pre-planned, you've kind of defeated the purpose. Yep, and Greg, I think you wanted to add to this point also. Yeah, I just so so obviously there's a lot of uses. Um, I think uh, also covered in in the implementation guide is you know where this would fit into the existing we wanted to make sure that we were using the existing system which has been tested over you know a very long period of time um and for those of us who remember maybe before the full nim structure and the ics um training modules and the reimbursement forms and all of those things were readily available those now are are readily available they're accessible to everybody and then in addition um, there are state and local emergency response plans where this fits directly into that so what we wanted to do is take this existing mechanism one of the main things that um, is a real benefit of using this stored energy in these batteries is one it's it's very mobile meaning that you can drive it to where you need need it to go um, the other thing too is that uh, you are reducing the emissions that might otherwise be um, at the at the very ground level uh, where people are breathing this air and under emergency response scenarios, if you're using a diesel mobile generator that 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 emission source is, um, you know, it can be eight feet above the ground and, you know, exposing people to those emissions. What this does is this helps eliminate some of that exposure and really in line with what we're trying to do with electric school buses in general which is really reduce the emissions um, exposure to to everyone who's around and it's the drivers it's the kids it's the public um and uh being able to use maybe hopefully clean energy sources as well so that that is um in the resiliency aspect there is also an opportunity to be able to pair up solar canopies and be able to do some resiliency around that as well where maybe these batteries can also be recharged, um, especially if there's no grid power, that there's still an energy source that would be able to charge the batteries when it's needed. Thank you. Manoj, can you please talk, talk about how you see electric vehicle and electric vehicle charging applications evolving over time? Yeah, great question. Um, again, we see a movement towards DC charging. We see the opportunity to have every one of these school buses in the US bi-directional. It's a tremendous opportunity. In addition, one of the things that we've implemented now being acquired by Borg Warner, which is a hundred year old company, we've actually extended our standard warranty to five years. We wanna be tied to uh, the life of the school bus, if not longer. We also offer optional warranties up to 10 years. So these are all key elements um, as you're making your infrastructure solutions. In addition to that, we have a technology called sequential charging, which means you can put multiple dispensers on a single power cabinet, up to five. What does that mean? Well, as an example, uh, let's say a school bus battery size is 150 to 250 kilowatt hours. You drop the kids off in the morning, pick them up in the afternoon, maybe you're only using 20 to 40% state of charge. You can charge each of the buses one at a time with sequential charging. That drives the infrastructure costs down to a fraction. In addition, I actually, I'm in the state of Michigan. I have a, a school district I'm working with. They've told me that they can use the, the EPA funding that Ladine mentioned and use DC charging and go four to one or five to one and be cost neutral. So stay under the EPA funding amount, which is I believe 13 to $20,000. Why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you take advantage of a technology that really would be future-proof you're not charging level one, level two, which can take days, if not a week, to charge a school bus. Why not take advantage of DC charging, which we believe the sweet spot for most school buses is about 60 kilowatts of a DC charger. That's what's the most popular for us. But also take advantage of sequential charging to drive the cost down per connector underneath the EPA funding amount. 
So it becomes free. So this is an opportunity to be bi-directional, sequential charging, get a warranty tied to the bus. You wanna make sure that's aligned. The other key thing is about service. Um, I'm giving you all the reasons why I joined uh, our company, but I'm very proud that we build everything in the US. You need to know where it's being built. Are you gonna have spare components? Are you gonna have service? How, what's your service agreement? All key elements, I think it also builds on what Kevin and Greg, Greg said about training. Who's gonna train your facilities folks? Because they're coming from diesel or some other fossil fuel. Having a partner, it's really about a partnership and be able to put all of that together in terms of technology, because you're keeping these buses for long periods of time. You wanna make sure you can handle not only um, your concerns for today, but also in the future. So uh, I, these are all aspects that we've seen that we've been able to execute. And again, for us being now part of a hundred year old company, we have now have the resources to be able to uh, deploy uh, nationally. Fantastic, thank you. Kevin, can you please uh, connect where you and first student are seeing electric school buses deployed earliest and in relatively large numbers and how that might dovetail with or facilitate the use of bi-directionally enabled electric school buses for emergency backup power purposes? Yeah, our primary deployment uh, currently is in Quebec, uh, Canada, uh, where there are significant programs supporting school districts uh, uh, and, and operators in acquiring school buses. Uh, outside of Quebec, you know, you really see California uh, leading the way uh, with the programs there. Uh, New York follows uh, closely behind it. Uh, and then you kind of go north and south of, of New York uh, in terms of the states right around there that have pretty significant programs. And then along the West Coast uh, is where we're uh, seeing the initial deployments. Uh, from a B2G perspective, you know, if you're looking to make revenue from selling back to the grid, you know, that's kind of a limiting factor at the moment. Not all utilities have programs in place uh, to do that, but we're working with a number. We have pilot programs underway with several utilities right now use, utilizing our buses and charging infrastructure uh, to figure out, A, the technical issues around that, uh, some policy issues, but then also actually what the revenue uh, potential generation is. On the vehicle, the V to X side, where we're looking to do projects like this, again, where you've got some states that are more prone to disasters uh, that have gone through a variety of things, be they earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, snowstorms, you know, significant uh, wind events, uh, they tend to be more open to looking at these options and, and want to explore some, some possibility. Uh, funding always remains a, a, an issue on this because though you've mentioned a lot of great programs that are available, they're not necessarily available for a water treatment facility to put stuff in at their place. Uh, you know, Nevi has to be for fleet operations and the EPA money has got to go to a school district. Uh, so there's some weird things about that that we're still a little behind on in terms of finding uh, the right resources to pre-harden some quote unquote infrastructure uh, uh, facilities that you could park a bus at to, to run them. That's very helpful. And that uh, fits into uh, SAFE and the EC are working on fixing and filling in some of the gaps in the policies. So those are things for us to think about as we go forward. And Manoj, I think you wanted to jump in here. Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Kevin said, and I'd like to highlight uh, a success story that we've had. And again, it's coming. It's early days, but it's pretty exciting. We have uh, working on a program in Massachusetts and Vermont uh, with partners that include system integrators, um, the bus manufacturer, utility aggregator and utilities that they're deploying in, um, in those two markets uh, this last summer in 2022. And again, this is not for the entire country, but it's coming. They made $10,000 per school bus doing bi-direction. It's publicly available. You can always uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I can share with you that what's available, but this is really exciting for us. I, I am hoping if there's some utility folks on, on board that we can deploy this across 3,000 utilities. I know this is, um, I'm, I'm still a capitalist. I apologize for that, but it's, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunities that are there and uh, we're doing it today. So if you're putting in, uh, if you're part of the EPA program, you're electrifying your school bus fleet, um, it will come because there are renewable portfolio standards that are being more stringent for each utility. There's peak events happening in the middle of the day. Uh, 5 to 9 p.m. So there could be some opportunities as as our country goes away from fossil fuels. So just something to consider. 
and look at the success stories and it may not be in your market, but it's coming. That actually is a great lead into to one of my next questions, which is what are, can any, for any of the panelists, um, what are some of the other use cases or applications associated with electric school buses, this bi-directional charging capability and their potential use in emergency situations? Well, for us, there's first behind the meter. Uh, so uh, just reducing energy consumption at, at, at our facilities uh, and managing our energy load uh, as, as we charge the buses in that regard. Uh, and that's important. I think people lose sight of what you can do behind the meter uh, with the school buses, uh, which can be advantageous. And so, you know, I think there's one of the misconceptions out there is where are school buses parked? Uh, so I think a lot of people think, oh, they're parked next to the high school or, you know, that type of deal. Not necessarily. Uh, you know, only in our case as the largest operator, we're only about 7% of the time are we parked on school district property. Uh, and that doesn't actually mean we're co-located at the school. Uh, it just means it's school district property. And so that makes it kind of difficult. You know, that's why it's a case by case basis. So if you look at a school that has a number of school buses parked there, then you've got a lot of opportunities, particularly like if it's a high school with a high energy load. Uh, you can do a lot behind the meter, but that also allows you to do a lot in an emergency response situation as well. Uh, to meet because many schools under the National Emergency Incident Emergency Plan are designated as shelters. Uh, so you could immediately transition the school buses to running the power of that school so it operates as a shelter. Uh, it feeds people. It does the things it's supposed to do uh, uh, under that plan. But again, that's going to be case by case because you got to look how many school buses are parked there? Are they even on the same side of the road? Even crossing the street uh, in some utility territories is a big no-no. Uh, you, you can't run the power lines uh, across the streets. You gotta be on the same side. And that gets into policy issues uh, we need to address as well. But then I've touched upon the other use cases. I, I think it's everything from, again, charging a cell phone all the way up to uh, providing power to a hospital. Great. Um I'm gonna ask just one question and then we're gonna open it up for audience uh, questions. Can you briefly, any or all of you as the panelists, uh, briefly talk about some of the additional challenges that are currently limiting the widespread deployment of bi-directionally enabled electric school buses and charging equipment for emergency backup power purposes and how can we overcome some of these challenges. In other words, can you speak to some of the challenges and some of the solutions briefly? And then again, we're gonna to turn to the audience. Manoj, do you wanna start? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, um, and, and, and I'm very happy, uh, Ladine and Will, what you're doing today, is education. Making folks aware that this is available, that this is not um, just a one-off pilot. This is happening throughout the country, throughout North America. Let's take advantage of this. Part of it's just education, because there's a lot of uncertainty of oh, you know what do, you know. A lot of the school districts we deal with, they they've made the purchase for the bus, or they've gotten uh, funding for the bus. They're not thinking about the infrastructure up front. So if you are secured, if you're fortunate enough to secure funding and and have plans for electrification, great, congratulations. Start planning the infrastructure now. If you're gonna do it next year. Start planning it now. Let's work together. We can do a site assessment, review the site, understand what your needs are, find a qualified electrician, find the right partners, and really research the technology. This is a great forum uh, right now to even talk about this. And just education is what's, uh, I think, a challenge is that I'm seeing a lot of decisions being made on infrastructure that unfortunately they'll have to replace in a period of time because they're going to have buyer's remorse. And the example I always give is that you're going to Best Buy, would you buy a standard definition TV if for the same price you get high definition or 4D? Why would you do that? This is an opportunity to do this right, do it once, find something that is robust, reliable, that can do bi-directional in the future, you know, good warranty, good service, good partners that are going to be with you in a long period of time because you're going to keep these buses as some of our customers are five years, 10 years, 12 years. So you want to you want to think beyond just today. So that is, I think, a key element and maybe a potential roadblock of infrastructure that exists that maybe it was put in for a different reason. 
Super. Kevin or Greg, before we open up to audience questions, do either of you want to jump in? Well, I touched upon it. I think my John is right on the education, particularly first responders. I don't think they necessarily thought about this uh, uh, and what can be done there. So that's kind of critical. Uh, but you, you do have a lot of policy issues yet to contend with and technical issues. Uh, the utility is very concerned about what's known as eye lengthening, anti eye lengthening. They want to make sure the power is not going to go back up the power lines and, and hurt or even kill an electrician, one of their power line people who's repairing a system. So there's some standards that need to be set. Most of them are out there, but getting again the utilities, the first responders, the OEMs to all agree that these are the standards we'll put in place so we're not going to cause damage. We're not going to harm somebody uh, when we do plug in to run everything, like I said, from the street lights uh, at the intersection uh, all the way to the hospital. Great. Greg, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add in really quickly. Um, so through all of this and um, Manoj and Kevin, you guys, I'm sure, you know, support this managed charging aspect. You want to be able to make sure that that charging is done in a way that is um, assistive to the site. It's, it's, it's you're staying away from demand charges. You're being able to manage that charge in a very um, planned uh, way. This, this fits in nicely with that. We don't ever advocate or recommend that there's unmanaged charging where you just go and plug in and the, and the bus just starts charging. You want to be able to do that in the time when energy is abundant. You want to be able to control your bill. You want to be, and this is all at the depot site or wherever the bus is actually being parked. And then if you can do that at that depot site, um, which is, you know, which is done with managed charging and with these charging mechanisms that we've talked about, you can also then, if you have the that charging capability or that or that um, dispenser at the school district or the school building, then that fits in easily with that as well, which means that you could also manage that charging and manage that discharging of that energy. So this all goes into the plan, which is there might be uh, a tendency to want to just do something really quickly as cheaply as possible. This is where, you know, that planning and foresight, Manoj, you mentioned this is like, you don't want to have that buyer's remorse where you go, oh, now I have all this, this huge electrical bill that because I'm plugging in all these, these school buses, and then um, I have really no control over that. You really want to get that control up front and realize that that's an opportunity that you have um, for you to benefit the, the, the school bus owner and operator, as well as, um, as well as being able to participate in potentially some future mechanisms. And Kevin mentioned this, but there's going to be probably more and more of this. We see this with some of these policies coming out where there is the ability or there's some mandates around being able to participate on V2G, being able to feed that energy back, or even if it's a benefit that doesn't have to necessarily be a revenue stream, it could be a cost benefit where you're actually receiving a credit on your bill to offset your main electrical use. And that load is going to increase when you're displacing fossil fuel with electrons. So it's a different fuel source, but it still costs money, right? So those are so I think those are some of the things that fit into, you know, electrification in general, that this also helps um, supplement this activity and, and set it up for that, for success. Great. Thank you. And with that, we're going to open up to audience questions. Will, please kick us off and read, some, read the first question. Absolutely. And uh, we've got a ton of questions and 10 minutes left, so I'm sure we won't get to all of them, but we'll jump into them. I'll try to combine a few, too. So... First one, I think, uh, Greg, might make sense for you to start with as you're with WRI and the Electric School Bus Initiative. Um, this person uh, lives in upstate New York and uh, around rural communities uh, that are worried that electric buses won't be effective and might have to use alternate fuels like hydrogen. Um, uh, can you explain maybe why uh, electric is better and, and from an equity perspective, um, you know, how are we going to ensure that uh, electric school buses are, are deployed uh, in the communities that need them most as, as mobile power units? Yeah, so so I think that um, there's a couple of things there, and it, it sounds like to me that there's a range anxiety issue. I think that that um, because when I hear that there might not be enough power to or the bus might not be able to get to the location, I think that that goes to route planning and it goes to the the availability of um, and Kevin can speak more to this, but um, in those communities also the other thing too is 
when you're looking at some of those, um, those other fuel sources, like hydrogen, for example, there's a lot of infrastructure that goes into that as well, especially as a new fuel source. And it's not readily available everywhere. Everybody has electricity right now for the most part. I mean, you have the grid, you have infrastructure in place. There are there there is a mechanism that is already there to be able to supply this fuel source to um, to these facilities. The other thing that I would say is that there is a risk when, with uh, especially with fossil fuels where you have delivery of the fuel to the facility, you have storage of the fuel at the facility. In some cases, these th that fuel is being stored underground. There's a lot of um, protection that's needed for that because if, you, if it leaks, then you have um, issues with you know, fossil fuel contamination of groundwater sources or things like that. Hydrogen can, it can also be a, an issue around, it has very tight controls around it and even to create the hydrogen it takes a lot of energy to do that as well. So, um, so I think with this, we're looking at utilizing that existing energy source, those electrons, especially if we can get them from renewable resources. I, I, I would love to give Hawaii as an example because there are times in the middle of the day when we're at 80% renewable, eight zero, and that's with great wind and good solar resources. And, and that means that the electrons that you're putting into those buses are also 80%. Um, generated from renewable resources. That is a, a fantastic fit for, um, for displacing fossil fuel and being able to use these clean energy resources that don't have these emissions. If you're going to, in, and that's coming more and more and more along, along the line. So um, you're seeing more and more renewable energy come into the picture. So as the grid gets cleaner, you have these electric school buses, when the grid gets cleaner, so does the the, the electric so do the electrons basically that go into to feed these sources. That's not necessarily the case with some of these other energy sources like um, compressed natural gas or propane or um, or hydrogen. Great. I'm, I'm going to add. Yep. Go ahead, real briefly though, because I want to get to as many audience questions as possible. But please go ahead. Oh, I think you froze. Oh, we lost Kevin. Will, yes, please combine questions where you can. And I'm just going to reiterate to um, our panelists to keep the responses brief. Kevin, do you want to add something real briefly before we take the next question? I think Kevin's frozen. Will, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, uh, so in addition to school buses for vehicle to uh, X resiliency or, or vehicle everything resiliency, uh, what other fleet vocations, uh, if any, have been explored for, for providing um, a similar um, um, similar uh, uh, value. Yeah, if I, if I could speak, we, we really have been focusing uh, the last few years on the commercial vehicle side. We've done bi-directional transit buses, last mile delivery, garbage trucks. It's a pretty exciting segment. Uh, we're actually talking to some OEMs with on dealerships too. Think about any sort of use case where you have a commercial vehicle um, and maybe some passenger cars where you have a defined duty cycle like school buses where you're delivering good services people and it's coming back to a depot, that's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, so these are all segments that we're looking at. Great, Will, next question. Uh, open the, this one's for the you know anyone on the panel here. Well, what, are the, what do you see as the biggest challenge uh, in designing a suitable school bus uh, Vita X resiliency program and how is solving that issue approached uh, or best overcome? Kevin, I know if you're not frozen, I know you wanted to jump in on the last, maybe I'll let you start and then Greg pick up maybe real briefly. Oh, I think Kevin's still frozen. Greg, maybe jump in real fast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, can, you, can you repeat that last part, Will, sorry. Yeah, no, no. problem. Um, uh, what are the biggest challenges in designing oh. a program like this and how to overcome yeah. those challenges? Okay, so we have a whole bunch of tools and resources out there which kind of um, walk you through these steps. I think that, um, and, and WRI, and we make those, uh, those tools and resources available for free. So they're downloadable. Basically, it, it, you know, I, I mentioned that the fuel source is electrons. Uh, you, you need to be talking to your utility first, not last. I think that's one of the biggest things is that the sooner you bring them on and as, as your partner in this um, electrification effort, the better it'll be because there are supply chain issues. There's some other things that need to be done. 
Um, if you're if you don't have the proper power at the facility, you might have to upgrade your 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 connection or your service capability to a higher power. Um, uh, you know, being able to to increase the the amount of energy you can receive at that site. Those are really important conversations. And then in addition, we're always advocating for these to be grid assistive. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting the grid. And that's where the community comes in. When you can use these resources as grid supportive, then that means that that's less um, maybe use of peaker plants. If you can peak shave, meaning that you can take, you know, not charge when everybody else is coming home from work and there's the highest load on the grid. That is a, that's good for the whole community. That means that you're using more efficient energy and and you're being able to use those more efficient resources. So anyway, I'll stop there because I know we're running out of time. Great. Will, next question, please. Yeah, so uh, given that, you know, we've just released a report, a guide and a, an implementation guide uh, and an MMA template, you know, what are the next steps uh, uh, for someone wanting to move forward uh, with doing something like this? I can speak you to that. Okay, you go. If you want to go ahead. Well, you know, we're super excited that uh, the actual stakeholders and, as I said, the entities involved in implementation can take this guide and the MAA template. And the, the template is meant to be uh, able to be filled out online or electronically and to be able to follow the steps to, uh, you know, implement this process. But, and again, the guide includes the steps to take before, during, and after. It's not exhaustive, but it's meant to include some of the key steps. And so uh, really it's meant to be very practical to help make this happen. And I just, I also wanted to add in because I wanna make sure that we alleviate any fear of this, which is the mutual aid, the mutual aid agreement is in place for the resource if it's available. Which means that you're if 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 it's not available, if it's if the bus isn't charged, if if there's a problem with you know being able to provide that resource, just like in any other mutual aid agreement for a, a different resource, a mobile diesel mobile generator, if that resource is not available, you're not obligated to provide that. This is a this is basically saying, and this is where we really want to go. We want these mutual aid agreements to be included in these state emergency response plans and local emergency response plans as a potential resource so that they're actually obligated to the community first, rather than going to some private, you know, private entity that doesn't necessarily benefit the community and is looking to mostly just maintain their operations. This is around providing these resources for the community if they're available, when they become available. And that's why we wanna get these in, included first and now, so that as this moves along and Manoj, you sell more chargers and more dispensers and power con you know, power control units, that, that this is set up and ready to go and that this, that this avenue is already put into place. Great. And I think Kevin and Manoj wanted to add one last thing and then we'll wrap up, but we're thrilled that there are so many questions. This is a very timely topic and uh, we hope to continue uh, these types of educational opportunities. As you said, Manoj, this is a great opportunity to be able to reach a large audience. So we hope to continue this. Um, so with that, uh, Kevin and Manoj, and then Will, I'll let you wrap up. Yeah, I would just like to say quickly, people in the audience, propose a pilot. Go to the school district, go to a first responder, uh, come to a school bus operator like us and let's put a pilot out there. I mean, that's what it's going to take because, you know, I think every first responders from Missouri, you know, show me first. Uh, so uh, uh, let, let's get some pilots going out there. And first student will be happy to participate uh, if we're in a jurisdiction where, where somebody would like to look at this. Fantastic. Manoj? Uh, and, and I think some folks are already doing this. Please, please reach out to me. Uh, consider all of us a resource. Uh, it's about education. There's no bad questions. I I I am pers I have children. I think we all have children. Maybe you've heard my joke. No one hates children. It's something either no children have children. We all want want this to be successful and, and do the right thing. But please reach out to us if there's any questions and if there's any way to educate. Um, thanks. Great. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Really appreciate your taking the time today. And Will, over to you. Yeah, thanks. I know that we didn't get to answer all the questions, but but please feel free to follow up. Uh, I think my email will be dropped in the chat uh, here in a second. Uh, follow up with any additional questions. Um, I know there were a couple on 
Uh, funding opportunities, I'll just plug that there are, uh, in the appendix of the uh, guide, there are um, uh, additional funding opportunities uh, for programs like this that you can check out. Um, but uh, yes, I want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists today, uh, taking the time to share with their expertise with us. I um, also want to thank WRI for their invaluable support and partnership uh, during this uh, report and project. Uh, and also uh, a special thank you to uh, Dr. Rigotto Solo, a former colleague uh, who also worked uh, uh, and was instrumental on the completion of this, this project. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this webinar uh, and the reports uh, will be available online um, on the Electrification Coalition's website. And um, please don't hesitate to reach out to uh, any of us if there are any uh, follow-up questions. Thanks a lot for your time today, and uh, we'll see you soon.